Safer Pilot Challenge. On December 16th, 2021, at 10.07 Eastern Standard Time, a Cirrus SR-22, November 162 Alpha Mike, was destroyed and was involved in an accident near Knoxville, Tennessee. Hey everyone, Jason Shepard here, M0A.com. Welcome to day 23 of the 31 Day Safer Pilot Challenge. I know a more somber note to start on, so let's just keep going and dive right into it here with this NTSB report. The private pilot was fatally injured and the passenger received serious injuries. A review of the radar data and voice transcriptions revealed that the pilot, November 162 Alpha Mike, was conducting practice approaches at the time of the accident event. Air Traffic Control advised 162 Alpha Mike to extend their downwind and issued a traffic advisory for an Airbus A320 on a three-mile final. The pilot advised ATC that he had the traffic in sight. ATC instructed the pilot to follow the A320 and was then cleared for landing. Radar data again showed 162 Alpha Mike turning base approximately 1.8 miles behind the Airbus A320. At about one and a half miles on final approach, at 1,000 feet, the radar target for 162 Alpha Mike was lost. According to first responders, they observed the pilot about 30 feet from the airplane on their arrival to the accident scene. They reported the pilot had third degree burns on his body, but was alert, conscious, and responsive to their verbal commands. The pilot said he was returning from a 45 minute flight. He encountered wake turbulence on short final. The pilot said the airplane lost lift, was rolled inverted. He activated and pulled the ballistics parachute and said the airplane hit the ground and burst into a fireball. He said his passenger climbed over him and assisted him out of the airplane and bystanders used fire extinguishers to extinguish the flames. That pilot unfortunately passed away later from the injuries and that pilot was a good friend of mine named Charlie Schneider. You certainly know uh, Charlie's company. It's My Go Flight, and he was one of the founders of My Go Flight. If you're a lifetime member of M0A, you get one of those nice uh, My Go Flight bags uh, as well. And you've seen me fly with my, uh, my Go Flight bag and kneeboard, and they're just amazing, amazing people. Why do I start out with this, with this tone? Well, first off, I want to pay a tribute to a, to a really, really uh, good friend. We'd see it every Sun and Fun, every Oshkosh, every AOPA flying, just a great, great entrepreneur, pilot, and, and businessman, and, and father uh, in there as well. But I want to use this to teach about wake turbulence. So often we think of wake turbulence just on takeoff or landing, but here's an NTSB report that happened in the traffic pattern of all places, on final, at a thousand feet, a place you wouldn't expect to encounter wake turbulence. So in this video, I want to shed some light on wake turbulence and on wind shear for that matter as well. We'll kind of incorporate that in there together. Here's the first thing I need you to understand is all aircraft generate wake. 2-3 Mike Zulu, it's not a whole lot of wake, but she generates some wake as well. And wake turbulence can be encountered at any point, even in route uh, as well as you're flying if a large aircraft is passing above you. You need to understand that the larger the aircraft, the more lift generated, thus the more wake generated as well. Um, they're, they're heavy, right? We talk about the most wake being created when an aircraft is heavy, clean, and slow. That's a written test question for private pilots, by the way. Heavy, what does that mean? Well, it requires more lift to become airborne. Clean, what do I mean? I don't mean all the bugs off the leading edge. I mean, they're without flaps. So the, the need for that higher angle of attack to generate uh, lift being dirty with flaps, well, that, that hastens the wake uh, decay. And then slow, right? Well, the higher angle of attack, they're generating lift. So wake turbulence is worse when an aircraft is heavy, clean, and slow. When is an aircraft its heaviest, its cleanest, and its slowest? Takeoff is a good indication of that. Hey, be mindful, by the way, helicopters generate wake as well. A popular commercial pilot written test question is, well, how does that wake travel? Well, vortex circulation is outward, upward, and around. You can actually see that circulation pattern, how that works. It's this counterclockwise rotation, really trailing behind the, behind the aircraft, out 
up and around might be a better way to really remember it. So you need to visualize that. Now, when you hear the phrase, if you haven't heard it already, you're going to hear the phrase at one point in your flying career, uh, to the Mike Zulu, caution, wake turbulence. Now, ATC typically gives, and if you ask is required to give, you three minutes to wait behind large departing aircraft. An A320 takes off. I'm next in line to take off. I'm just leaving a little class Charlie Airport, let's say. Two, three, Mike Zulu, you're clear for takeoff. I'm able to say, uh, unable, I'd like to wait my three minutes, please. And listen, they're required to give it to you. Never hesitate to ask for what's called your three minutes. Uh, it is so vital. You know what? That may mean you're waiting there a little bit longer but at least you're waiting on your three wheels. You're not waiting upside down, you know, waiting for first responders to come because you encountered wake turbulence. You see, as the pilot in command, it is your responsibility, regardless of what ATC says. So now let's talk about how do we avoid wake turbulence? Well, on landing, we're always taught, right, to stay above the glide path of that preceding aircraft, to touch down beyond that preceding aircraft. And that's all very, very correct because that wake is going to descend. You want to stay above that glide path. But what about on takeoff? Because I was always taught rotate prior to the preceding aircraft. That's right. And stay above their, their flight path. And I always thought, it's an A320, like, or it's a, it's a, you know, whatever it is, a 737. What do you mean stay above their flight path? My 172 doesn't climb that aggressively. Well, watch where they rotate. And by the way, when do they start making wake? The moment they start making lift. When do they start generating lift? The moment that nose wheel leaves the ground. Watch that point that nose wheel comes up. It'll be easy for you to rotate before them. It'll be very difficult for you to outclimb them. So it sounds good in theory when you read it, but in real life, out climb them the best you can, a nice VX climb, and then ask for a left or a right turn out of there. Don't stay on that departure leg any longer than you need to. Now, the other one that gets neglected often is this in route phase. And I've been in situations with aircraft crossing above me, and I thought, this is not a good little spot to be in. Well, do your best to stay upwind of that aircraft or adjust your track if you're on the a same track. And remember how we talk about that wake travels. If you're trailing somebody or getting overtaken from above, right, right behind them isn't a terrible spot because that wake's going to head out in a V-shape. It's when you're a 45 degree off of them that it could pose a little bit of a problem for you as well. You want to avoid... Um, uh, that flight kind of below and behind as much as you can. That's tough if you're getting overtaken. Consider the winds though too. A strong crosswind's gonna blow that wake on across. No wind condition, by the way, increases the time that the wake remains on the runway. And actually, in another written test question here, uh, a quartering tailwind will push that wake back onto the runway and remain on the runway longer. So if you ever get the written test question, what wind type keeps wake turbulence around longer? It's that quartering tailwind. And then also, I know many of you fly out of parallel runways. Um, don't forget that. A 737 may take off on, on nine or left, and you're taking off on nine or right, and you got a crosswind that's going to blow it right on across. Uh, so just be very, very mindful of that. Uh, AIM Chapter 7, Section 4 does a great job if you want to learn and see some more. Can we switch gears? I'm sorry for making this a longer video, but this is, it's a, it's a topic near and dear to my heart. I want to go from, um, from wake turbulence to switch gears to wind shear here for just a second. Uh, because wind shear, just as devastating effects but I don't have the airplane in front of me to make it obvious, right? Wind shear can be very insidious uh, and it's hidden often with bad weather in there. Um, wind shear, really, I mean, it's due to changes in wind direction and or speed. Um, usually 500 feet per minute or 15 knots is all, is all it really takes to cause those shearing winds. Remember wind shear uh, can be, we often think of it in the horizontal, but wind shear can be vertical as well. And I've been caught in some vertical wind shear before it's genuinely terrifying. I was in 512 Romeo, my little Cessna 150. It was a microburst situation. And I remember flying, looking, I and mean, we were, the nose was, was dead level. And my vertical speed indicator pegged itself at 2,000 feet per minute down. So I was 
2,000 feet per minute descending or greater. And I remember going, I, I'm in level flight. Like there's nothing, you're not gonna outclimb this thing. It's similar to how you teach your kids when you go to the beach how to get out of a rip current. It's usually a very concentrated column of air. I mean, just a shallow little bank turn to get out of that and within 20 seconds, which felt like 20 minutes, I was out of it and, and fine, recovered with plenty of altitude, but it was full power and just the tiniest, don't try to climb it, just, just bank out of it because it's a concentrated column of air. Now that was in route when that happened on an IFR flight. It's really dangerous when this happens during airport operations. Approach and takeoff are the most dangerous because you're so close to the ground. And it's unexpected. I literally, I didn't have any clues, or if I did, I missed them. It was truly unexpected. I had this sensation of falling, and I looked at my vertical speed indicator and confirmed it. Everything else was great, right? So I had the need to react quickly. And notify ATC, by the way, uh, if you have to execute uh, wind shear escape maneuver. And a pie rep is so helpful because it's not just you, it's the other people back behind you. Hey, um, it doesn't mean anything fancy. Uh, Jack's approach to Thurman Zulu encountered abrupt wind shear, uh, 800 feet on final, required maximum thrust. It, it's that simple here. So how do we counteract wind shear? And we've shared some stories about it here. Um, you've got to be ready to go around at all times. Uh, I'm a stickler for teaching. You'll see people want to fly with two hands on the yoke. I'm a stickler for always flying, one hand on the yoke, one hand on the throttle. So you're always ready to go around. You as the pilot need to recognize an increased headwind, uh, or tailwind for that matter, and have your shear responses with that. Uh, rapid power changes needed, right? You're having been back and forth on the throttle. That's a good indicator that you're dealing with this. And obviously weather is a great indicator as well. Is it associated with a microburst like mine was, a thunderstorm? Did you know Virga is actually a great indicator of turbulence? Virga is rain that is falling but doesn't make it to the ground. It's a great indicator of turbulence. Another one is temperature inversions are a big clue uh, to really watch for. And even weak cumulus clouds, they, oh, they don't look that bad today. If it's hot, dry air, it can produce some wind shear with it. Other obvious ones, fronts going through the area with steep wind gradients. What happens, right? How, another written test question. I feel like we just turned this into the written test prep boot camp, which you can access, by the way, mzuratrial.com. There's my sales pitch. Um, what happens when a front goes through? How do you know a front has passed is a similarity to the written test question. It's a 180 degree change in winds. Well, let me tell you, those winds don't just go 180 degrees from 360 to 180. It happens slowly and it shears its way across as it works to turn those winds 180 degrees. Very, very common to find wind shear after frontal and during frontal passage for that matter. You see, you have to learn to make smart go and no go decisions based on weather. Sometimes you can check all the weather and still find yourself in that situation. Hey, I know the 31 Day Safer Pilot Challenge has been a ton of fun. I'm sorry to add a bit of a somber uh, note to it here, but listen, uh, you can be an amazing, amazing pilot like Charlie um, and, and still find yourself in, in difficult situations, I think is the most uh, correct way to put it there. We end every video saying a good pilot is always learning. If you're 23 for 23, will you check in down below uh, because you truly are living out that mantra that a good pilot's always learning and in that pursuit of mastery. Keep on flying, keep on living abundantly, and most importantly, remember, a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow. Hey everyone, don't forget the m course prices are going up on February 1st. So head over to the m store to subscribe now and beat the increase. Existing members lock in their prices for as long as they maintain their subscription.